Right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week of classes. Okay. Uh, so uh, before we start, can any one of us please lead us in prayer? Uh, let's just start with a word of prayer this week. Can one of us please lead us in prayer? Can I pray? Go ahead, Charles. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful morning. It's a morning here in East Africa. I believe for mornings in many other countries, but we thank you for a time like this one. But Lord, as we continue to learn our past, to learn the past of church, to learn the missions, to, to be equipped, to be encouraged, because the more we know, or uh, uh, the past of the church we will be able to plan for the future. And Lord, there is a reason as to why you are teaching us this. Now, Lord, we are set. We are expectant. We can't wait to hear from you through your servant, Pastor Paul. Lord, I pray that you will guide him, you will talk through him. But also, Lord, you will open our inner ears that this thing will go deeper than hearing, so that we shall internalize it, meditate on it, and be able to apply it in our ministry, in our lives. We pray this trusting and breathing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Charles. Okay, so uh, last uh, week we looked at how Revival started out of uh, Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, it moved, the outpouring, the revival fire moved into Antioch. And then from Antioch, it went into Asia Minor, went into Europe, and finally went into Rome as well. So we looked at that. Then we also looked at uh, the, the man, Apostle Paul, who was a carrier of revival. So we looked at his wonderful journey, right? Uh, his first missionary journey, his second missionary journey, his third journey, and how through that uh, revival spark that was there inside him, uh, he was able to do such marvelous work for the Lord, right? Uh, uh, we see the number of churches that was planted. We see that um, he went into uh, hostile environments and he was able to start a community of believers and, uh, uh, you know, do a work uh, of God in these places. And uh, we looked at his final journey as well as he was going to, uh, uh, you know, his, his uh, going to Rome, uh, what happened there as well. Uh, so we completed this chapter. Uh, we're going on to chapter three. Before we go to chapter three, anybody have any kind of questions, any thoughts that you have uh, on what we've been studying? Uh, please feel free to share or if you have any questions to uh, you can go ahead and type it in the chat. Uh, I know we covered quite a lot. Any questions? Any thoughts? Okay. All right. So uh, I want to encourage you, um, uh, each one of you, if you can also spend time in these, especially Paul's missionary journeys. Um, uh, personally, it has been a real encouragement every time I go back to his life, studying uh, what he has done. It, you know, there's this spark of fire that gets reignited every time, and uh, the Lord really encourages us. So I want to encourage you as well. Go ahead and, uh, you know, cover the book of Acts, study it. Uh, I'm sure the Lord will lead you too. Okay, let's move to chapter three. Um, uh, I'm on page 27 uh, on the notes. Now, in this chapter, we're going to learn, there's going to be a lot of uh, dates and events, but what we want to emphasize is not about the dates, but more on the events, right? And what happened during those events. Now, so this chapter, we will travel through 2,000 years of church history and we look at what are the significant things that impacted the church and significant people 
who impacted the church, right? Like reformers. We will look at study also a few reformers, a few mm -hmm. revivalists uh, and missionaries and uh, their missionary movements and how um, it impacted the church as a whole. So uh, why do we want to learn? As Charles mentioned uh, in his prayer also, the reason we want to learn from church history is because we learn from the past, we can gain insights from the past and you know, uh, learn how to try to understand how God works uh, uh, you know, in the church, he has a pattern in which now I'm not. We are not saying that okay, God will work only this way. You know, God works in His own ways, but uh, you know, He has a pattern for His uh, for the church, and so that's one reason. And secondly, we must know church history. We must understand it. We must, uh, you know, interpret it the right way, uh, so that even when, as we make decisions for the future, we can look at church history and say, "Hey, okay, uh, this is something that probably worked out, or this is something that uh, didn't really work out." These are the challenges that they faced. Of course, the culture, the scenario is different, but there's a lot we can learn. Mm -hmm. And going further, also. Uh, uh, you will have subjects like apologetics and world religions. And so uh, these subjects, uh, even through these subjects, you will learn about how, uh, you know, it's important to give a defense. And so church history will come into play uh, in each of our lives if, you know, as God has called us to minister to people. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9. Can one of us please read that? Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. So we see here Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the word deuto means a second time, right? Now God is, uh, you know, exhorting Moses and he's saying here in this verse, uh, only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself. And so the entire book of Deuteronomy is only a reminder of what happened um, when the people came out of Israel, right? Sorry, when the Israelites came out of Egypt. So it's like God is telling Moses, see, there are new generations coming up. They don't know what happened in the past. So if you if you read the book of Deuteronomy, it says everywhere you'll see, remember, remember when God took your, when you were slaves in Egypt. Remember, we took you out through God's mighty hand. Remember that God parted the seas. Remember. So there's a lot of remember in this book. Why? Because the new generations will not know what happened. Maybe some of them are wondering, why are we living in a desert? Oh, you know, oh, uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh, where are we going to? And so Moses writes here and he says, teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. So God instructed his people to repeat stories of the past and make it known to the new generations right so he did not want he did not want them to forget what their fathers and their forefathers had uh, seen learned and experienced right so so it's important right uh, uh, let's also read joshua chapter 4 1 to 7 it's quite a long chapter but let's read that joshua chapter 4 verses 1 to 7 can one of us please read that Joshua 4, 1, 7. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan, 
place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men who made appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. That this may be a sign among you, when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off, were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Amen. Thank you, Christopher. So we see here something very interesting. God has brought the people out of uh, the, Israelite, the Israelites out of Egypt, gone through all the things that have happened. Now they've passed the river Jordan. The next step is get into the promised land, right? So God did not say, okay, uh, okay, all of you, Joshua, now you're in charge. So just go into the promised land. Uh, just walk in. No, he doesn't do that. What does he say? Set up. He he instructs Joshua to set up a kind of a memorial so so that when people come this way, they'll say, hey, what is this memorial about? And then they can tell the story. Hey, we were slaves in Egypt for 400 odd years. God in his mighty hand brought us out and uh, he took us through the desert. And these are things that have happened in uh, during the wilderness. And then he brought us to Jordan and he helped us to walk into the promised land. So a story is being told. And so the succeeding generations will remember what the Lord has done for them. So, so we see here that it's not only about us, but God himself is, is, uh, you know, he emphasizes on remembering the past. And there is a verse which says, do not remember the past, but um, uh, press on ahead. Yes, but that is, a, that is uh, you know, taking into context. Uh, you know, God is uh, telling uh, the, uh, in the book of Isaiah, he's exhorting them. He's saying, uh, forget about the past of all the sins that you are living in. Forget about all of that. But look ahead because I will bring you out of captivity. That is context. But... It is important that we remember that God, what God has done in the past, he expects us to go back, remember. And when we do that, this will inspire faith in our hearts, right? Uh, there may be battles that we all are facing uh, day after day, but these, you know, as we go on from continuing, we'll, we'll study a lot of uh, people in church history, right? Revivals and uh, revivalists, missionaries, and the work that they have done. And uh, the, the reason we want to study them, that's because th they will inspire faith in each of our hearts. They were normal people, just like you and me, uh, but they did extraordinary works. And uh, and so we can believe God uh, to work in similar ways in a similar manner in our lives so that we can also gain victories as well, right? So let's look at, we're going to divide this into the first century church, the second century church, and the third century church, right? Uh, 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 and then we'll go on to the fourth century as well. So this week, let's look at first and second century. Let's see if we can cover this, right? Now, uh, as I said, there's going to be a lot of dates, but more than the dates, what we want to learn are key events and uh, uh, key people involved uh, during the first century uh, uh, church, right? So the word AD is an abbreviation for Anno Domini, which is a Latin phrase, which means the year of the Lord. Uh, 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 and, and so let's look at what happened. AD 30, approximately about AD 30, Jesus Christ is crucified. He rises from the dead. AD 30, uh, the day of Pentecost. Um, and then after the Pentecost, we know what happens, right? The revival just moves out. Uh, AD 52, Apostle Thomas uh, reaches uh, India and founds a church in India. Uh, AD 64, uh, Nero launches persecution uh, to the Christians and he 
sets fire Rome. Um, and then later on, AD 60 to 60, 66 to 68, Paul and Peter are put to death uh, uh, again by Nero. Now, here's an important event. AD 70, the church in Jerusalem, right, is destroyed. Uh, if you remember, uh, if we read through the Gospels, the people used to meet at Solomon's colonnade. Right. Uh, uh, why was that? Because the construction of the temple was happening, right? Uh, the where the Jews could come and offer their sacrifice. So there were only portions of the temple that were open that time. But by this time, the temple was already ready, uh, but it was destroyed by the Roman uh, generals, uh, an emperor named Titus. Uh, after that, AD 70, AD 90, there was a council called the Council of Jamnia. Uh, now, this council was important. Why? Because in this council, the, they made an acknowledgement that the Old Testament, Hebrew Testament, uh, was considered to be uh, canonical, which means it was said, OK, this is the canon of the Hebrew scriptures. These are the, uh, you know, the books that have been considered to be in the Old Testament. And so it was during this time, 1890, the Council of Janmia, uh, where the whole, you know, the, the articles were put together uh, and they said, OK, this is the Old Testament canonical scriptures. Right. So it was set during that time. Uh, so all this is happening in the first hundred years after uh, the G after Jesus' death, after the church was birthed, so hundred years, right? 1895, the book of Revelations was written. Again, these are letters that were, uh, you know, we studied about uh, Apostle Paul as well, and he wrote many letters. They were not yet put together, right? So Paul's written letters to different places. Other disciples also write letters to different churches, but they were not, compiled like how we see it now right so uh, later on even that gets compiled so um ad 98 apostle john dies ad 99 all new testament writings are completed right so we see in the first hundred years quite a lot of uh, material or writing things have been compiled Right, the Council of Jam Jamnia, which is AD 90, 90 years after uh, the resurrection of Jesus, we see that the Old Testament Hebrew canonical scriptures was confirmed. Right now, why is this important in church history? Because we need to know that you know. So, if you remember, uh, 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 the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, he they asked him to come forward and read, and he. He came and he opened and he found the scriptures of Isaiah, right? So it was not yet, they were only basically scrolls of probably different books, right? So uh, we could say maybe uh, maybe Deuteronomy was rolled up and kept. And, and so they were kept in the temple uh, in, in different scrolls. It was not put together, right? But now, about 90 years later, uh, in the first century church, the book was compiled, the Bible of the Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures compiled and put together. So it's a very important event, right? And we also look at uh, other writings, book of Revelations, uh, Apostle John dies. And, uh, and so this is the first hundred years of the church, right? Uh, let's look at the second century. Now, by the time the second century begins, uh, all the disciples have passed away, right? The disciples of uh, Jesus Christ uh, have passed away, right? So now comes a new generation, right? Um, the last person to die is uh, Apostle John. Now, we do see that um, some of his uh, followers or people that he uh, trained up take on the work of the ministry as well. But the second century church, uh, the second year the, uh, was, was a very, very difficult period. Uh, because why? While persecution was continuing to happen, heresies became a danger in the church. 
right now these heresies uh, just like how we see uh, you know paul remember we studied about paul and how he wrote to the thessalonians why because the thessalonians people said that okay jesus has already come and gone so paul sits down and he writes he says no uh, don't you know that you know these things should happen only then the the antichrist will come and all of that so the same thing the enemy is using heresies and false teachings uh, to affect the church so what are some of the false teachings during that time first one gnosticism when we say gnostic it's a it's a new age movement it's more of a it's more like mind over body or you know uh uh, a, a, a claim of a secret knowledge, right? Uh, so there are many claims about many kinds of, uh, uh, you know, if we read about the New Age movements, uh, they sound very nice, right? They sound very interesting. Oh, this is, uh, I can get peace of mind or uh, my body. I can, uh, you know, it, I, all my sicknesses can go if I get involved in the New Age movement. I can have, uh, you know, a karma, whatever all these things are. So these Gnostic movements, New Age movements began to creep into the church. Right? So some people started saying, hey, uh, probably this is what happened uh, in the church where people ca came and said, I have a, you know, a secret knowledge, a secret understanding that if we do this, if we go to a mountain and sit there and pray uh, for about 30 days, then we will find peace of mind. You know, these all these new kind of movements. And so uh, people had to deal with that. Then we had Marcionism, uh, which was uh, a group of people who came and said, OK, I see that the Old Testament has got so many books, so many letters, so much of writing. So let us reduce the scriptures. Let us select certain scriptures or let us select certain books and only study from that book. Right. Now that became a problem because remember in the uh, uh, 1890 the Council of Germania, it was confirmed the Old Testament was brought together, put together, and uh, it was confirmed as a canon of the Hebrew scriptures. But now this group of people are coming and saying we can remove off probably certain books from the Old Testament and only study what is required. So then that again was a problem. Thirdly, uh, uh, Montanism. Now, this is a very interesting, uh, you know, if we do a deeper study on Montanism, it's, uh, you know, they're very, very charismatic in their movement in the sense that they uh, they would appear like they were, they were just doing something right, but uh, they were not led by the Holy Spirit. It was more of the work of the flesh. So uh, Mon uh, Montanism was, they led people astray through new revelations, new prophecies, and you know, uh, passing judgments on Christians. And so we see that in the second century church, these heresies or these problems continued. But here's the thing. It was there even in the first century church. But did the work of the Holy Spirit stop? Did the outpouring or the revival stop? It did not stop. Right? Was there persecution in the early church? Yes. Was there persecution in the first century? Yes. Was there heresies? Yes. Was there false teachings? Yes. But did it stop the outpouring or the, uh, the revival move of God? No, it did not. Right? Uh, we must understand that it is the same devil doing the same tricks then, and he is doing the same tricks now. Right? Uh, and so we must be aware. We must be aware of what is happening in the church. Right? So let's look at the second century. Right? So some of the key events to remember in the first century is, of course, we all studied it, the church in Jerusalem, uh, all that happened through the apostles, the church in Jerusalem, AD 70, that was destroyed, AD 90, the council of Janmea, Apostle Paul, Apostle John dies. So these are key events that we can remember. Now, the second century church. So 100 years of the church is over. 
let's look at the next hundred years of what's happening in the church, right? So we saw that these three things were prevalent. Now, Polycarp, a person was a disciple of Apostle John. Now, Apostle John was the last disciple. So he lived about a hundred years, right? And, and so he raised up many leaders. Uh, so Polycarp was one of the leaders. Now, we don't know uh, where he raised him up, but uh, he was appointed bishop in Smyrna, which was a church, right? So, but, so what we see here is even in the first century uh, church, uh, Paul writes to uh, uh, you know the church in Ephesus. He's writing to Timothy. He says there are bishops, there are deacons, and all of it. So we see some kind of a hierarchy uh, that was you know uh, it was not probably. Uh, you know, uh, it was not a steady or something that was already formalized but, uh, throughout all the churches, but only in this church we could see that okay, there was kind of a hierarchy. But in the second century church, this whole thing of bishops, deacons, leaders uh, was already set in place, right? So it was all set in place. So uh, the the second century church would have seen all the churches would have seen uh, you know leaders bishops deacons they would have seen a hierarchy uh, being set in place already so he was appointed uh, then there was ignatius of antioch again uh, a student of apostle john uh, now here here ignatius of antioch was a very well learned man uh, uh, and then he was able to write letters. He wrote seven letters to churches, and the many of them were about the deity of Christ, about communion, about the structure of the church, about bishops, about deacons, their responsibilities, uh, and and all of this. Uh, but here's the thing: remember, second century also persecution of Christians was very strong. Uh, the Roman persecution was highly, uh, you know, involved in. It was like they were eagles behind the Christians, right? Uh, anything that the Christians do, the Romans wanted to cause persecution. So he wrote uh, this letter to the churches, but finally they they found him. Uh, he was captured, uh, Ignatius of Antioch. He was taken to Rome, where he was martyred. Right, and uh, he was martyred by being fed to wild animals and wild birds. Uh, so it was a gruesome death. But why was this? Because of what uh, they, you know, they they were able to impact the church, and so that caused, uh, you know, a, a whole problem to the Romans as well. And so after this, we will we see a lot of writings where they say apology right now apology here does not uh, uh, does not say okay these uh, writers the christians are apologizing to the romans no uh, they are writing the word apology is to give a defense of their faith peter writes that in first first peter he says be ready to give a apology or a defense for the hope that is within you so many writers rise up to write apologies or apologies. Uh, and so uh, some of them were written to to the uh, to the uh, Romans. Some of them were written to the Christian within the church uh, because of the heresies. And, uh, and then some of them were written to uh, uh, people of other faiths as well, right? So you will see a rise of apologists in the second generation church. Now, um, the reason we call them apologists is not like how it is now, okay, you're an apologist, you're a pastor. No, uh, the reason, reason they were called apologists was because they were able to give a defense of the gospel, right? Against the wrong things that was penetrating within the church, right? Uh, and so there was a person named Justin Martyr, uh, uh, AD 155, he was an early Christian apologist, one of the most famous apologists. Um, uh, and he was a prolific writer, which means he wrote a lot about the scriptures. He wrote about how uh, the grace of Jesus Christ, justification by faith and all of this. Uh, 
and he wrote his apology uh, and many people uh, you know who had gone away from God or gone into Gnosticism and uh, all these other beliefs came back to the Lord right now it's interesting that you know there was no preaching of course there was a lot of preaching in different places but even these writings were able to impact people's lives uh, if we study about Justin Martyr, people who read their letters would weep. They would cry, oh, I've gone away from this. And they would come back to the faith. Uh, right? Bishop Polycarp is another person, uh, another bishop. And uh, he, was a, he was a powerful bishop. Uh, uh, history says that he was most probably in Ephesus uh, because uh, he was under... Uh, 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 under John, the uh, disciple of John. Uh, now, he again uh, wrote a lot of uh, apologies, uh, which is uh, books, uh, writing material saying that this is how the church is, this is what our forefathers thought, this is what we should follow, we should turn away from all this Gnostic teachings and all of it. Um, again, his writing went throughout the church, different churches. Uh, and finally, the Romans were able to catch him, and he again was martyred, right? Now, as we go on, I just want to put this forth that, you know, we may see a lot of this martyrdom work. Now, uh, you may wonder, why are we studying all this? It's only, it should not cause any fear inside us, right? It should only encourage us. You see, people were willing to give their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not possible to do that uh, if we are, if we don't have that revival fire, that fire of the Holy Spirit inside us, we will not be able to come to this place, but they were able to, right? Uh, then there was a leader named Irenaeus again. So uh, just like, um, you know, uh, how we raise up leaders now, it was the same way that time, right? Where, you know, John, and under John, you had Irenaeus, you had Polycarp, you had, so he, all these leaders went to different places and they wrote to, uh, different kinds of styles, right? Now, Irenaeus, he was rose against the heresies and he wrote a thorough book on Gnosticism, right? He writes what Gnosticism is, if we, uh, you know, if we read about uh, Irenaeus, he was a powerful writer. He wrote a thorough book. He said, okay, this is what heresies are. This is what Gnosticism does. This is what the word of God is. And this is what God has called us to do. He writes this letter. And after writing this letter, he goes to the bishop, right? And he says, this is the letter. This is an apology that I've written against the heresies that are happening within the church approve it and send it out to the churches again now uh, they they do that and you know since these people are men full of wisdom and great writers uh the, the letters go everywhere again the romans get to know about it they catch him he again was martyred so then later on uh clement of alexandria another uh, man from egypt uh, he was a great Christian theologian. Uh, what he did was he went into uh, Alexandria. Now, remember that um, uh, the gospel in the first century had gone all across Asia and Europe. Uh, so this person named Clement of Alexandria, uh, he wrote to the Christians in Alexandria. He wrote three books. And what was his books? His books was, uh, he was expounding the teachings of the Bible. So probably he went into the Old Testament or he looked at a few scriptures, a uh, few letters from the New Testament. He went deep. He began to expound. He said, this is what the scripture says. It's not about what we are about all these Gnostic and, uh, and all these other New Age movements. It's about the gospel. And so uh, he expounded, he wrote three books expounding uh you know the the christian faith now what happens later on he uh, the the their own christian uh, 
leaders catch him and they say that you know you're uh, involved in false teachings and uh, he was put into prison and he went through a tough time later on um, he was martyred as well uh, finally in AD 190 uh, a person named Patienus uh, of Alexandria he goes into India uh, uh, and why does he go there because the church is started in India and the Christian leaders in India don't know what to do now we know that India as a nation has lots of you know uh, uh, you know uh, idol worship and other kinds of gods known to have the most number of gods in this world uh, and and so uh, Patinius goes to uh, India because the Christian leaders in India says please come we don't have any uh, you know any leaders here to teach us to train us so he goes willing to let go of all the you know the uh, comforts of his home and they go into India and again does a powerful work in India the church is established leaders are raised this is most probably during this time where the churches in India especially began to see a, a, a hierarchy okay so you got bishops you got uh, uh, you know pastors deacons leaders uh, uh, and, and and things like that so hierarchy began to be established and most of it was done by this man uh, Patinius but he was later on nabbed by the um, Indians who uh, later on uh, and later on was martyred so we see here the second century church right uh, one of the things that uh, always comes to my mind is this that which is born of the spirit will always bring fruit but that which is born of the flesh profits nothing right always remember this that which is born of the spirit now when we look at the first century church it was born of the spirit right the work the outpouring happened it was it was a work of the holy spirit now it's like a fire which you know a fire by nature spreads you can't tell a fire to not spread it is a nature of fire to spread and so we see that that same fire from the first church first century church moved on to the second century church right you see the same aspects of the Holy Spirit working. People were willing to give their lives for the gospel. People were willing, they were unafraid, they were uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit, God given wisdom to write these books, to come against the heresies that was happening within the church. Uh, and you see that what is born of the flesh is always, sorry, born of the spirit is always a work of the spirit. It will bear fruit. Now, something that is born of the flesh, later on we see in the 4th century church, um, uh, we see that so many things are born of the flesh within the church. It, it went on to be a work of the flesh and it didn't profit anything. Right? Uh, so even as we, in our ministries, in anything that we do, remember that what is born of the Spirit will always give birth to the work of the spirit what is born of the flesh will die away right it will not profit anything yes charles uh, you raised your hand go ahead uh, charles uh, charles uh, do you have anything to say do you have any questions I see that you raised your hand Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Manohar says, do we have any further information about ministry of uh, Platinus of Alexandria in India? Yes, there is. Um, uh, there is information, but it's not, uh, it does not, uh, there's no information of, uh, you know, where all, what, what are the places he went in India? Uh, but yes, there is information of uh, what kind of ministry he did when he went into India, um, but not in detail. Uh, so maybe you can uh, look online, go to Google, check. Uh, but from from what we know, 
this is what he did he uh he came into india and was able to do a work there so yes uh, i you. think charles is yeah welcome uncle yeah yeah anybody else yes back. charles i, I think you raised your hand again back. yes, yes. I'm back. Okay. The time i go ahead i wanted to know okay whether the three books that clement of alexandria wrote can be found on on google under the ari church christian writings is it possible okay uh thank you for that question charles yes so i didn't really check whether these books are available on google so maybe um uh you know in your free time after your sessions today we can check uh but most probably uh i'm sure that there were articles of these books copies made why because uh it was not sent to one church right uh, uh it was sent to a bishop uh and those the, this this whole article was given to different churches so uh so it could be that there were additional copies made but it also could be that what happened was because of the roman persecution the romans were you know always looking for a way to wipe out christianity they did not want christianity to be there so it could be also that many of the writing materials of these great leaders uh, were burnt so for example uh, later on we'll read study about john hus and many other missionaries and revivalists you know when they were burnt uh, to the stake or they were uh, you know when they were martyred they would usually burn all their writings uh, in a in a in an act of defiance like it's like saying uh, the romans are saying if you believe in uh, this christian faith you will burn and the writings also will burn so it was you know it was like an act of defiance so many of the writings may not be available right their personal writings uh, may not be available because uh, they were all destroyed by the roman uh, uh, you know leaders and because of the roman persecution so um, uh, it also came later on we will study it also came to the point where you know they wanted to just wipe out even the old testament scriptures and the bible itself uh, there were plenty of attempts by the romans to you know just get rid of the bible but uh, uh, praise god that that did not happen so yes charles to answer your question um, it could be there you could check online uh, but if it's not uh, not available it's only because most of the material was destroyed uh during the time of martyrdom i hope that answers your question charles thank you pastor thank you charles okay okay so we've completed the first century church first century is something that we all know but it's interesting to see the second century church and uh, the work that they did um the leaders that were raised up these wonderful men of god uh, so 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 empowered by the holy spirit uh they still were able to impact many lives now we must understand that uh, even during this time uh this persecution the roman persecution the church only began to multiply right uh, it's not that okay persecution is happening and uh, nero and all of these other leaders uh, roman emperors came and they tried to destroy the faith yes they tried to destroy it but here's the thing the fire was spreading the work of the holy spirit was spreading the word of god was moving so even as the persecution is rising we see that the church also began to spread right uh and, and so the more the persecution the more the church began to spread and does this happen now yes if we read about what's happening in places like you know uh, i've used this example before but it is said that uh, iran uh, has one of the fastest growing churches in the world iran right uh, now when i say church it's not just one 
church uh, location, but I'm talking about the body of Christ as a whole in Iran. Iran the most is a persecuted country for Christians, but Iran is the fastest growing church in the world. And it's slowly spreading into Iraq uh, and, and other places uh, 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 where you know it's Muslim dominated nations more the persecution more the gospel is spreading right and so uh, next week what we'll do is uh, we will look at probably we can just look at a few aspects of the third century church uh, since we have a little more time uh, right so 100 years 200 years now 300 years uh, uh, the third century, right? 200 to 300 years. What's happening now? Turkey becomes a Christian state in uh, AD 200, right? Many leaders. Now, these are very famous leaders, um, uh, theological writers. Now, a lot of these people are, pe uh, uh, these th Christian theologians are, uh, you know, in the first century church, we see that, you know, not many of them were educated except for Paul and a few of them. But here in the, in the second and the third century, many of them were well educated. All right. Uh, they were lawyers. They were businessmen. Um, and they were willing to let go of all of that for the scriptures. Uh, and so we see great theologians like Origen, Tertullian, Clement of Alexandria. Uh, right. All these great leaders in uh, the church and there was an emperor named Severus Roman emperor in the what he does is he says no more conversion to Christianity now this is a hard law that is passed right uh, something that's happening even now uh, in in our nation of India uh, especially in the north of India where you know, at certain places where you're not allowed to become a Christian. So the same, the rule here was nobody can convert to Christianity, but Christianity continued to spread. People continued to accept the gospel. People continued to accept the Lord Jesus. The law was passed, but nothing is, the, remember, the Holy Spirit is greater than any law. When I say law, I mean the law of the land. Now, that does not mean that we don't obey the law. Yes, we obey the law of the land. But remember, the Holy Spirit is above that. The Lord is above all of that. So the emperor of Rome writes a letter, says, anybody who converts to Rome, uh, sorry, converts to Christianity will be put to death. What happens? Nobody is getting scared and saying, oh, I can't become a Christian. Nobody is saying, oh, um, you know, I want to let go of this. No, the church began to spread even more. The great Christian lawyer Tertullian uh, and Carthage, who was a, uh, uh, an apologist uh, uh, in North Africa, writes about, um, you know, the church. They begin to write about something called as uh, uh, his Praxeus. It's a, it's a book that he writes. And, and in this book, he talks about the Trinity. That is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he's the first person to use the word Trinity. So uh, Tertullian is the first one to use the word Trinity. So the word Trinity comes only 200 years after the birth of the church. Right? So this is an important event that we can remember. Tertullian, a great Christian theologian, lawyer, he sits down, he and uh, probably with uh, Carthage, who's from North Africa, sits down and writes books and tracts about the gospel of Jesus and emphasizing on the on the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and how they are uh, three persons, one in a sense. And uh, this material again went out to different churches. Right uh, now, imagine or picture this. They're writing all of this, but in the back of their mind, probably what's happening is, hey, if I get caught, I'm going to die. But that did not stop them. They knew that if they get caught, the Romans are not going to clap for them. The Romans are going to take them and martyr them. But that did not stop them. 
right uh, he, he they be, uh, and tertullian he writes wonderful uh, he 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 writes an expose on the book of isaiah and different kinds of uh, letters in the old testament uh, talking about how the work of god is how the holy spirit works and many lives were touched the church began to expand here you got the romans trying to uh, you know uh, wipe out christianity put an emperor service severus says no conversion to christianity here we are seeing these great men of god writing books impacting lives many lives uh, uh, you know touched and the church just expanding so we run out of time so we will close today we will pick up from tomorrow uh, we'll pick up from this third century um, we'll get into the fourth century as well and uh, we can uh, uh, continue to study on this. It's it's really interesting. So uh, don't be alarmed about these dates and all of it, and also the number of people. But what you can do is just uh, probably mark these important events and uh, people that caused a, uh, a difference within the church community uh, during that time. So. All right, so let's just close, uh, quickly close in prayer, and we'll pick up from tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you, God, for, for your word, O Lord. We thank you for what we've been able to study from the first century and the second century church, Lord, these great men of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, doing a wonderful work of God. And Lord, even as we study this, we pray that you will minister to each of our hearts, Lord, that you will revive that spark of fire in our hearts, the work of the Holy Spirit, to do what you have called us to do, that we may be empowered by your Holy Spirit to fulfill every call and purpose and vision that you have for our lives. We thank you, God, for this wonderful opportunity to study your word. We speak a blessing over your, over each and every student, oh God. Bless them in their studies, oh God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Amen. day. See you tomorrow. Amen. Thank you, Pastor God. God bless. Thank you, sir. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor.